Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to do something a little different in this session. We are not going to talk about AI. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we are going to talk about some of the things that Heather talked about in terms of that new customer experience, um, how you can implement uh, solutions to adapt to that customer experience, composability, those things. So we're not totally going off script here, but a little bit different. Um, so I'm Lindsay Vallon. I am uh, the SVP of Professional Services at Pros, and I have an awesome panel here of some of our partners. So I have uh, I'll let the, the folks introduce themselves from Ernst & Young and G uh, BGSF. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Lindsay. My name is Kunal Kothari. Uh, nice to see you all. I'm a partner at EY based out of our Houston office, and I've been uh, doing front office transformation work for the last 18 plus years. And I've been working very closely with pros for the last six years out of that. So looking forward to this session, everybody. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Peters. I'm uh, president for the Professional Services Division of BGSF. We are a global workforce um, solutions firm and consulting operation. Uh, we're a company that exists today due to 13 acquisitions around the globe. Uh, we've been partnering with pros for a number of years through an acquisition we did out of Texas. And uh, really looking forward to speaking with everyone today. Brian Goonan, I run our sales and pricing transformation practice at EY, based out of Chicago. Um, and I've been working with large sales forces, which includes CRM, CPQ, and all the other acronyms, uh, probably over the last 20 years. Uh, Hitesh Talari, SVP at BGSF. Uh, very similar experience has been working on digital transformation and business transformation for the last 20 plus years. Yeah. All right, so let's get into it. So I'm gonna start with you, Kunal. You know, it wasn't too long ago that all software implementations looked the same. They were long, they were waterfall, they were hard. <laughs> right. So what do you think has changed in recent times, right? And, and we're, what, what are businesses really looking for when they think about implementing software solutions these days? Sure, absolutely, Lindsay. So, can you guys hear me? Yeah. So, that's, that's, that's actually a very good question because gone are the days wherein clients are looking forward to having five to six to seven months of discovery and design phase followed by seven to eight months of implementation phase and then they get to see the value of something that they've implemented 18 months down the line. You know, nobody has the appetite for that anymore. Uh, clients, are today looking for rapid approach to delivery, agile, fail now, fail fast, if we have to. Um, so that is the general trend that we see in the market. And this approach has numerous benefits, right? And we are implementing this already with some of the clients. You know, I was giving an example of a client where we implemented a CRM case management solution and we created a prototype for one of, they had eight business units in total where we had to implement this. We took one of their simpler business units, we implemented that solution literally in 10 weeks, and we used that prototype, that pilot release, as a basis for the design to further iterate on top of it and roll it out to other business units, right? And that was a phenomenally successful, right? We have a go live coming up in June. We already had three, two releases. The third release coming up, and People are, you know, we are currently in the UAT phase uh, with them and things are working, knock on wood, pretty well. The other advantage is when you do things in an iterative fashion, it really motivates your team members as well, right? When people are working on the same things over for so many months, their energy level keeps on going down. But if you are seeing progress on a continuous basis, progress drives motivation, you know, and that's what we always, pre that's what we see in the market as well. Progress over perfection is what we preach, and it's worked very well for the, for the team that implements it, as well as for the clients as well. Progress over perfection is one of my mantras. I love that. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. So Hitesh, kind of building on that, yeah. um, I think we all up here are a proponent of this model, of being agile, of you know, being rapid. But I can say that there are still some customers that are a little bit leery and you know, maybe conservative or, or a little bit unsure of how that's going to work. So. You know, how do you go about convincing some of those customers that this really is the right strategy uh, to drive success? No, uh, no, I agree with everything Kunal said. Um, and so to your point, uh, what we have seen uh, is just having this customer-centric focus, right? Keeping the customers first. Uh, uh, 
uh, we in BGSF have the mantra that let's wow the customers first. Uh, and what we have seen uh, is just being together with them, taking them through the uh, phase over there, helping them implement solutions, design thinking that out of possible, right? It's where in many scenarios we have seen that the clients don't know what they want. So this kind of helps them push towards the direction and a similar example we had uh, two weeks ago. Uh, a client came to us, they wanted to be in a board meeting, uh, trying to get some ideas and concepts, but they didn't really know what they wanted. They spent an hour with us, uh, and we were able to do some design thinking and a concept for them, uh, which they took to the board, and they were able to seal the deal with us. So a you know, similar concept uh, to your point. Uh, we also, we also think gives flexibility and uh, risk management is also much simpler in this scenario. Uh, we look for quick wins, but we also encourage quick failures, right? With quick failures, you learn more things. So that's the process we follow. Yeah, I totally agree. And so we kind of talked about this implementation mo method that's a land and expand strategy. And I think that kind of then, let's expand on that from, um, composability in the solution side as well. So, Brian, you know, what are some of the examples that you're seeing of some more innovative ways that, you know, merging these agile approaches and also, you know, system composability that's really out there today? Sure. So, a couple of things. One, I want to build on Hitesh's comment. I think, you know, one of the things that we're discovering also in the market kind of goes with the iterative approach is making sure we do lots of frequent demos, right? Because people want to see yes. the tool. They want to see the tool in action. They want to know what else you can do with it, right? So, you know, I've done most of my consulting career on PowerPoints, right? PowerPoints and process flows was my life. And to actually see those translated into demos is something that clients are really looking for because then they can kind of see, feel it, and they're like, oh, okay, I see where you're going. Even if it is, you know, a little smoke and mirrors behind the scenes, we can get them on board. Um, but the other thing that we've done, you know, and we have actually a demo in the innovation center is we said, okay, what else can this tool do that our, that our clients are really looking for? So we have a dynamic deal scorecard, right? So if you think about a sales team, right, they're putting together a deal. For a lot of our B2B customers, that means it's multiple SKUs that are interrelated with each other, maybe products and services and solutions um, for the long term, right? So they're trying to get a deal together. And while you can look at each SKU and figure out some you know, profitability of each one, when you put it all together, sometimes it's hard to say, is this deal in total a good deal for um, our customers, for our co company? So we have a scorecard that kind of looks through all that. It gives you a score, very simple scorecard to look, and then you have the levers that you can pull. Am I discounting too much? Am I discounting not enough? Do I think it's going to sell? Do I raise some prices on certain SKUs but keep the other ones lower? So it's these add-ons that really you know, kind of empower the salespeople to make better decisions on your behalf. And I think the more we can think about how we take platforms like Pro's platform and start to embed some of those solutions within, because we don't want them to go off to another solution, go back to Excel spreadsheets. If everything is there that they need to close the deal, then we're doing our job right. Exactly, it's that extensibility concept, right? Um, that's amazing. And so Eric, I want you to talk a bit more about that concept of ex you know, composability and extensibility. And you know, what trends, you guys are really more into the integration space, right? And so what are the trends that you're seeing when it comes to customer selecting technologies? And again, how to leverage APIs and really bring that extensibility to life? You know, what are you guys doing in that space? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we do play in the integration space. You know, we, we, we um, are certified partners with Workday, Oracle, ServiceNow. And so Hitesh and I live in those ecosystems every day. Uh, you know, it was funny. I was listening to Dr. Wu's presentation, and he put profit up on the screen. And what we've seen the biggest transformation is when you're looking at pricing, you're looking at margins, it's not just growing revenue any longer. It's about truly measuring profitability. And there's so many components, as Brian just mentioned, that go into how you drive profitability. And what it comes down to is customization and not looking at things in a cookie cutter approach. And, and so, you know, obviously, Agile gives us the ability to do that. Um, we, we had a very, very unique opportunity. We're very fortunate to work with pros and build a connector tool between the pros platform and SAP. And this was directly taking feedback from the customer that they didn't feel they were getting the full optimization of what they were looking for, and they were trying to measure various components of profitability through that process. And so, like you said, Brian, we said, okay, let's actually do the demonstration. We're, not, we're gonna take this off of a PowerPoint, we're gonna go into the sandbox, and we're gonna show the customer how this tool will talk to its data, pull its data, and what the end result will be. 
Um, it, it's, it's an incredible tool. Um, uh, we're really happy with it. And I'll tell you, there's a webinar that we're going to be doing with pros on June 27th if you want to see a live demonstration of what this Brian's talking about and what I'm talking about comes to life. Uh, that's going to be a, a great characterization. You know, the role of the CFO has just changed tremendously. And, and I just want to highlight that for a second because we're interacting with the CFOs a lot. And you're seeing more and more organizations actually have the CFO manage the IT department, certainly the IT spend and the projects. And so to Atesh's point, when we're working with these people and partnering with them and doing these demonstrations, doing a proof of concept, and the customization piece, Lindsay, comes out where the customer feels like, you know, I'm just, you know, the, my IT spend is through the roof. And coming out of the, the, the pandemic, measuring cost more so of what it would cost to build a product or, or serve a product, the role of the CFO has changed so much. And so we're trying to, to help listen, engage profitability. And um, we think that these connector tools are another way. And then how you're using AI intertwined into those tools to talk to your data and tell your data, you know, let your data tell back to you what you may be missing at first glance. It's all about, again, that extensibility, putting the, the pieces in place to continue to grow on the solution that you have. So I think those, those are awesome capabilities. So let's pivot a little bit, Kunal. We t Heather talked a little bit about you know, everyone wanting the B2C experience, right? We all want the Amazon experience, and we can see the data saying that most B2B buyers now want that B2C experience as well. And so how do you see these more modern composable technologies, these implementation processes that we talked about, you know, really help to provide that desired experience that B2B customers want to provide to their customers, but also want when they're implementing software? Absolutely. I think we have seen that theme, you know, earlier this morning, Jennifer Dudley from HP, she also spoke about the same theme, where 75% of their B2B transactions were from self-service channels. And then we saw Heather um, also giving the same kind of an output from the research that she has made. And we are, we, are, we are seeing that in the market as well. Like B2B customers have started to expect B2C level services, right? Like we've all been spoiled by Amazon from the sales service mode, you know, how many on this room have actually ordered something from Amazon and have had to call anybody or email anybody to, so that the order arrives on your doorstep? Probably it's nobody, right? Zero. And Costco has spoiled us from returns standpoint, right? Like we can return anything at any time at Costco, right? So we get spoiled by these B2C kind of experiences. And I'll share a, a, a real life story. We are, we are working with this industrial products company. We did a voice of the customer analysis of their distributors you know they had different customer types distributors plumbers contractors their end users um, i'm going to particularly focus on this customer type distributors right because the results that were received from that voc survey was very very contradictory so where there were two indexes that we actually measured one was the customer satisfaction index of this customer group and the other one was the ease of do ease of doing business index right so they rated this customer this industrial products company, a 4.2 out of 5 on the customer satisfaction index. And then the same distributors rated them at a 2.4 out of 5 on the ease of doing business index. Right? So we, yeah, so we were intrigued by that, right? Like, so we were like, hey, let's do a double click on this. So we went to the distributor and asked them that, hey, why did you give these two so different contradictory results? So their response was, hey, listen, we have dedicated sales reps from this company. We have a phenomenal relationship with them. They give us phenomenal customer service. Our customer satisfaction is very high with them. OK, the, what about the ease of doing business? They're like, every time we have to place an order, we have to email them or we have to call them. We know what we have to order. We know how much we have to order. Why can't we do this by ourselves? You know, it takes us so much time to pick up the phone or send an email to, to just order something that we are used to ordering 500 times in a year, give us the power. We want the power to be able to do it by ourselves and not be dependent on somebody else. So these kind of trends we actually are seeing, that, that's the market research, and I can attest it because we actually see it on, in reality on the ground, right? And then to your point, tools like pros come into play over here because pros are the CPQ with the guided selling right. functionality. You know, if you think about guided selling, that's e-commerce. I mean, you can put that engine behind an e-commerce sales service channel provided to your distributors and change that game, you know, have them move from a 2.4 to a 4.5 on, right. on the ease of doing business index, right? So those are the kind of things that we are educating our clients to start adopting and start uh, taking it up. Yep, I love that. 
That's, and that's a terrifying story, though, right? <laughs> Inverse numbers, 4, 2, 2, 4. There, there's an opportunity in that story. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's good uh, you know, for us, because we can help on those things. So let's take that a little bit deeper, and I'm going to go back to you, Brian. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of customers that still have legacy platforms and monolithic systems, and moving to this new space of driving a better customer experience and needing to be more composable and extensible. You know, what do you think some of the biggest challenges those customers face are, and what are some recommendations we have to help them think about how they can start that journey and, you know, modernize or get to these new kind of experiences? Sure, happy to talk about it. It's, it's something that we work with our clients probably every day, right? And the first thing foremost is change management, right? So uh, we have a client right now, they love their Excel spreadsheets, so always use their Excel spreadsheets, gives them infinite amount of flexibility. Um, and so then you're moving them to an enterprise system like Pros, and all of a sudden it gets a little scary, right? Because you have to kind of demystify what's actually happening there. And so the, um, you know, having that experience and doing the change management of, you know what, what you used to do, you'll still be able to do, but let's get to the core of why you're doing it, not how you're doing it. So doing that shift uh, in kind of the mindset uh, from the change management, I think is important. Going back to what you talked about, you know, not only demos, but agile, you find those early change agents, right? The people who will start to embrace the tool and start talking to their peers around, hey, this will actually work, this will actually accelerate what we're doing, get us out of the minutia, the things that we're doing day to day that don't add value, and let me start focusing on the things that do add value. So I think change management really is number one. I think the other thing that's really important is making sure we're driving home the value of these tools. And it's almost a kind of, you know, a lot of our clients go out, they'll buy these tools for whatever reason, right? They think, you know, we, we do a great sales job, they're like, we're, we're bought in. And then I think they kind of forget, right? When you get into the kind of the myerdom of, of, of doing the implementation and the design, whether it's agile, waterfall, or otherwise, they kind of forget, why did we buy this? What are we really trying to drive? So reminding them of this is the value you're going to get. And yeah, it may take some time to realize that value. But these are the things that ultimately, you know, kind of what's at the other end of this rainbow that we're taking you on, right? What does that pot of gold look like? Um, reminding them of that journey and making sure that they're a part of that journey helps tremendously. Yep. And I'm going to answer my own question and build on something that Brian said, because we've actually been working together on a client. Yep. Um, and we rallied together. And for about six weeks, we just really did this kind of strategy jumpstart to make sure, to your point, we're super aligned. The customer was super aligned on where they want to go. And that goes back to what Heather said. you got to have the strategy, right? Where do you want to go? Um, and what's the value when we get there? And then as we are, we're now supercharged and ready to get into that implementation, rapid, agile methodology, and that upfront, you know, slight investment to just make sure the strategy was aligned, the value was very, very clearly understood, and now we're ready to go, we're going to make it real for them really fast. And I think that's a great success story of our partnership and also for the customer. And I think something else to really think about out there of how can you make sure you get off on the right foot um, and really drive that value, so... All right, I think I have one more question. I'm going to go back to Hitesh and Eric. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about change management. We've talked about, you know, this driving a better experience. And I think there is a tension between that because if you as a business want to drive a better experience for your customer, yeah. there is still the internal change management of how do you get the people inside your organization to shift to that mind mindset. And so, you know, what advice do you have for companies that are kind of navigating that, right? How you change for your customers and how you change internally at the same time? No, that's a great question, and I love the slide that Heather had, uh, where there is just an interaction between the CX and the EX, right? Uh, it's a culture uh, that, that needs to be ingrained in everything we do. And I, I take it back to the human piece of uh, AI. You know, we're trying to basically do what uh, humans do. So, you know, vision, uh, the strategic vision that comes from the top and from our leadership there, uh, the mindset, right, of collaborating with the clients and, and our employees together, and just embracing that culture of continuous improvement uh, and working that together. I know change management is something Eric is big about. Uh, we just got back from uh, Latin America uh, last week, and just the, the amount of excitement uh, and the hunger over there is just amazing, right? And we talk about Latin America, but such a diverse place. On one side, you have Argentina, uh, with an inflation rate of around 280% annually. 
and then you have Columbia on the side. And uh, I think prose as a software is something that really is something what they're looking for, composable, all that. But Eric, I'll talk, let you talk more about the change, change management piece of it. Yeah, and, and you know, Brian said it well. I, if, if I had to pick one area in doing this for over 25 years where I saw IT initiatives fail, uh, it was lack of change management internally. And you can bring in outside help. I mean, we're a workforce solutions firm. We certainly endorse that. But you need internal champions. And uh, what we've seen, it kind of comes full circle to the first question that you asked Kunal earlier, what, what we've seen, what's changed, right? And it comes down to really two things. Number one, um, you hear people talk about burnout throughout IT departments during IT transformations, IT system implementations, upgrades, et cetera. We see the best companies meet that challenge doing the reverse. They use it as a retention tool. So they pick certain individuals that are going to lead by example and are going to be the champions, and they highlight those folks, and they let those folks, they give them the mic, and let them step up and say, this is what it's done for the organization. This is where we see the future. And I'm telling you, I'm part of this go live team, and I've already seen it work. The second thing that we see is a big mistake is you can't always leave those same champions in that seat all the way through the initiative. You have to keep evaluating, again, to an agile methodology of, you know, Hitesh is very good at this part of the project, at this part of the technology, at this part of the initiative. He does that. He raises his hand. The billboard goes up on the highway in lights. And then we swap him out. And then Brian takes on this part of the initiative. And too many times we just get so embedded in whatever it is that we're trying to implement and change that we forget that this has to be an evolving process. And so that's something I would challenge everyone to look at, your own initiatives that you're tackling right now. Who do you have as your internal champions? And when's the last time you possibly switched some of those people out or added to the team or subtracted to the team to just reduce the monotony of what these projects and initiatives used to be? Right. And, and I think we talked about empowering those people as this is kind of a legacy for you and really own that going forward, as you said, to the part of uh, retention. So, Lindsay, one more thing, and yeah. I talked about Latin America and the excitement that is going on there. Now, we do have a session, uh, uh, Luis, uh, uh, Luis Sanchez is sitting over there, he's running a, he's going to do a round table specific to Latin America and the global development center that we have over there. So, uh, do take that opportunity tomorrow afternoon during lunch. No, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, this, the topic of change management is so near and dear to my heart, I want to actually also chime in over here as well. Messaging is extremely important when it comes to adoption and trying to penetrate change inside the organization, right? So think about this scenario, right? And we have learned this the hard way. If you tell people from the sales group, your pricing group, your service group that, hey, we are changing these processes, we are implementing this tool, and this is going to make you more productive and extremely efficient, guess what is the first thing that will run in their mind? Do you think I'm not productive and efficient right now? <laughs> right? But if you were to change that message to say that, hey, salesperson, we are going to make these process changes and implement this tool so that you can hit your targets faster, so that you get more commission on your sales, so that you can go to the golf course more often and build your client relationships, that is what they actually would want to hear. That's, that's is what is going to buy, get them the buy-in, like get us the buy-in from, from these user groups, right? So messaging is very, very key in how we are portraying the changes that, were, that we are planning to implement and make them the change champions and the change agents going forward. I love that. It's such a subtle but powerful shift yeah. of how you message it to somebody, right? We all hear about the WIFMs, but that's a very powerful message.